Yeah. Okay, I call this meeting of the Oskaloosa City Council to order. Uh, today is uh, Monday, May 20th at 6 o'clock. Uh, let's start with the invocation. Uh, the invitation has been made to the Oskaloosa Gateway Church of the Nazarene. I'm not sure if they're here tonight. If now, would you pray with me? As we assemble here tonight, we thank you for the blessing of the people in the room. We've all felt your call to be part of the future of Oskaloosa and acknowledge the need for your guidance. For the council members and staff here, we ask Heavenly Father that you bless us. Give us quiet and considerate attitudes, well thought out deliberations, and ultimately decisions that are best for the long term future of the city of Oskaloosa. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those in the audience here and watching the broadcasts. We thank you for leaders of businesses and organizations who have the vision and commitment to help the city the countless volunteers who are motivated to help, and for the informed citizens who have given us the privilege of their trust and support. So tonight we have assembled a group of people who are making a difference in the long-term future of Oskaloosa. So may the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call, please. Burnett? Here. 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 Joss? Here. Moore? Here. Hodgson? Here. Walling? Here. Gates? Here. Okay, thank you. Next item up is the opportunity for community comments. Uh, this item is reserved to receive comments from the community for concerns whether or not they're included on the current agenda. The community is encouraged to come and speak before the Mayor and City Council. We do ask that statements be kept brief, time limited to no more than three minutes. Any questions are to be asked of the City staff, Council members, or the Mayor prior to speaking to the full Council. So that way concerns can be properly researched and then answered away from the meeting. Comments are to be directed to the Mayor and City Council only. Uh, in essence, what do you want us to know? Um, is there anyone who would care to speak tonight? Yes, ma'am. My name is Christy Bridges. Uh, please go to the microphone. Sure. And uh, name and address, please. My name is Christy Bridges. I live at 1315 South First. I've been here before. The tile in the <coughs> north, alley, north alley of my property, which is owned by the city, divides the Vice family and my family. I'm lucky. I don't have any young children, but there's a lot of young children in that neighborhood. I have a sinkhole, and when Mr. Vice called the city, the city, the solution was to throw a couple cones out of out in the market. Well, I'm sorry, that is going to do it. This is a three foot, and it's probably three and a half or four feet deep. This is still not fixed. I've been here before, I think this is the fourth time in the 22 years that I've lived in that house, and all we want is for that to be tiled and be tiled correctly and not leave our yards in a mess like it was the last time. And what really, the reason that I'm really here is, God forbid, that somebody ha something happens to one of those children in that neighborhood, I've got a clear conscience because I tried to take care of it. So I do have a few photos here of the stuff. This is not from the big rain we just had in the last two days. This has been there for over two weeks. So this is something that has happened, you know, prior to the big rain. And it got worse after the rain because some of the tiling is just gone. It's just gone. So it was never fixed correctly in the first place. Can we see the pictures, Christy? Yes, ma'am. Chris, is this the same issue as several years ago when you were here at, at the north end of your property? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, it is. Around the garage, right? Is that it's, it's north of the garage. Okay. Can you go back to the microphone? Sorry. Okay. I, I have the actual corner of the lot. I have the lot, I have the lot the house sets on, the lot to the north and the lot to the west. Then the city has the alley that's between... Uh, Will and Jordan Vice, who live in that house with small children and animals and stuff. Um, he did make a call, and then the other thing was told to him was, well, just go ahead and fix it. It's not our responsibility. It's your alley. 
It's not our alley, and no, I don't want to buy it. <laughs> I'm just worried about the kids because there's, you know, I'm now the oldest one in that whole neighborhood. And the rest of them all got small children. I mean, you know, six, three, four years old, six, seven years old, riding bikes. They scabbing in there because, you know, it's a great place for the snakes and the frogs and all that stuff. So that's what really kind of worries me on the whole thing. Okay. And I, and I really hope that this is the last time I have to come here because I don't really relish taking the time off of work to come here and spending the money for the photographs that I should really have to do. On, the, on your lot, which, which corner, where, where's the location? I'm actually on the corner of 13th and 1st, and it's... And the, the, the sinkhole is where? Is that it's where north. Is? Okay, so mm -hmm. thank you. It's, it's probably, I don't know, maybe four or five feet from the garage, which is always wet, you know, because it doesn't drain right. I don't keep much in there because it's just not feasible. that you have in the blue is where Will and Jordan and Vice live. And then that is my garage here on the left. And the sinkhole is about where that, I think it's a phone or fiber optic, right? Yes. It's just a little bit right in there. Yep. I'm afraid to get too close to it because I don't know how stable it really is. Okay. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. I'd like to stay around and have fun, but I, I, like I said, I took her off early in the morning, so that means I've got to go in early tomorrow. Christy, what's your phone number? 660 4105. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm not home during the day. So. I'm not Thank either. you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. I have copies. Okay. If you want to keep them, you can. We'll get them mic. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Christy. You. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Okay. Seeing none, move on. Next item up is the consent agenda. These are all items that are pretty much routine in nature. I did want to uh, pull away item G. Uh, this is the one that has to do with uh, the approval of a pay application of $138,000. $138,367.50 to be exact uh, to Moscow Lighting for the new street lighting on the South B reconstruction project. Um, Councilman Yates is an officer with the corporation and needs to abstain from that one. And so I suspect he might want to support everything else on the consent agenda. Your call, of course. Yeah. Can I ask a question <coughs> on F? Okay, item F. Yeah, what are the hours going to be for the... Okay. Service. Yeah, this is. involve music or? Yep. Uh, to clarify for our audience, this is a, a request from Rock Island Tap at 206 Rock Island Avenue to extend the outdoor service area for an event on June 1st and 2nd. Uh, it doesn't say in the council provided documents what the hours will be. Uh, if it's something that they're going to be open till midnight, or if it's something that can be... And, and, and will there be any outdoor music? That's the yeah. point the neighbors always have. I'm not speaking for or against at the moment, but it's the same event they've had you know, now. Got some for, for even when Duffy was there, they had it. Yeah. Okay. It, it involves motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> So if that's the case, then yeah, that you're going to include outdoor music. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, we, I don't have any details. Do you have anything? I don't have the hours. Yeah, and memory is failing me as far as when things had to quiet down and 
that sort of thing too. Well, we had we had some guidelines on there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're yeah you know, they're not here in the audience to support this not to ask questions. I'm not against it. I just want to know for the neighbors in the neighborhood what time the noise. Well. Maybe we could do this. That uh, how about if we put the caveat in there that it would be the same uh, as rules a, as, as last year. Passion. That's great. Good idea. Okay. And I do think that was a request. Okay. 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 So that doesn't require a motion then, probably, since that's the understanding we're working with. Okay. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions on the consent agenda items A through F? Well, I had a question on the one you pulled for Doug. I would, is there something that I don't understand, or why do we have part of it's in the consent and then we're paying the final in the regular? So, Mayor yeah. Council, what we've done is the pay applications have been placed on the consent agenda for projects that we're working on, and then if there's an acceptance, a completion of the project acceptance, we put that on the regular agenda so that we can Because it's final payment. It. It's going to start warranty and it's going to start the retention, right? And the idea is that then we discuss and show the pictures of either the before and after or the progress that was made on the project. Okay. I think it was just because it was so close that made me think about it, but okay. Okay. I'm fine with that. So, do we have a motion supporting items A through F? So, second. Okay. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Burnett? Yes. Calendary? Yes. Drudge? Yes. Moore? Yes. Otteson? Yes. Okay, that passes. Item G <clears throat> is the approval of the pay application to Moscow Sports Lighting. Um, do we have a motion for support? So moved. Second. Okay, any discussion? Roll call, please. Yates? Abstain. Burnett? Yes. Calgary? Yes. Dross? Yes. Moore? Yes. Otteson? Yes. Walling? Yes, and the street and the lights look great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that passes. Getting into the regular agenda, item A is a presentation from the Oskaloosa High School project-based learning class. Uh, the description that we have the uh, city manager's office was con contacted by Oskaloosa High School teacher Autumn Reicher, Reichsetter in February to discuss a project-based learning opportunity her class was going to undertake. Autumn shared the idea that the students would like to evaluate the possibility of adding a splash pad to the community. Uh, the students would do all the necessary research, come up with the pro proposals, and then share their findings at a later date. On April 3rd, the students completed their work and shared the three concepts for community splash pads. And after the presentations, she, Miss, Mrs. Reichetter was asked if she would be interested in sharing the students' work with the mayor and city council, and she agreed. Uh, at that point, I'll give the floor to you. I'm Autumn Reister. Um, yeah, I'm a high school special ed English um, lab. I do uh, art every year. We're asked to do a project-based learning, and this year um, I started out to do an all-inclusive playground, but then they changed the theme to water. So I was like, well, my kids love going to Splash Pads in the morning, which are the closest in Grinnell, 45 minutes away. So my kids did research and they made designs and came up with different ideas, working with Scott to um, present and um, hopefully get implemented into an exclusive. Hello, my name is Scott Stephans. I'm actually a resident of Oskaloosa, 1909 North 1st Street. But in addition to that, I do work for Poly the Foremost Company in manufacturing splash pad equipment from the world, also Vortex Aquatic Structures. So Autumn asked me to help the kids and develop their project. And so I worked with them quite closely to develop their ideas and get those into a graphical format as well as, you know, looking at budgets and other type of issues, uh, site of you know, appropriateness, um, where they are located and, and what the solutions are for each one. Uh, so I'm here really to present the different options that are, are there for them. Uh, obviously a lot of them have graduated, or few of them have graduated, and so I'm going to be here for that. But uh, up on the screen, you can see, and I believe you already have uh, the passive information, we did three concepts. 
Uh, we identified three locations around the community as possible locations. Now, I want to preface that by saying that the splash pads can be located pretty much anywhere and uh, within a reasonable framework. And so, exactly where they're located does not need to be the final location. Those can be worked out through the city and through the community efforts. But uh, the ones that we have are Edmondson, uh, which is the first one on the screen. And what we looked at doing there is by the playground that's existing um, over by the, the west side, west entrance. Um, you know, we looked at how could that be integrated in there. I know there's conversation of, of possibly having that replaced at some point. So since there would be a lot of disruption, services could actually benefit very well together. Uh, typically, a splash pad will um, be partnered with or shared with a dry playground as well because of the shared usage. Uh, the reason it's uh, the size that it is and the space is mostly because of the location. Being that it's Edmondson, it's a large destination park, there's going to be a lot of attractions. We have the, the pool nearby and other things. It's going to have a larger capacity. A lot more people are going to go to that park. So this class, when they looked at it, they decided to elaborate on that design a little bit larger to make it larger to fit the, the parameter of, of what's there in the park. The next is, uh, there's a few images there to support it. Uh, some of the features that the children really liked uh, were specifically the large kite water features. They really like that. Our explorer line, which are the large, I call them beach ball looking pieces, uh, towards the right in the front. And then we also have some of our new water, uh, water journeys lines. They emulate stones there in the foreground there. Um, and those are really ideal for young children. One of the things that we talked about with the students is that when we are designing this, we want to make sure that it's as encompassing as possible for all different types of age groups, families, grandparents and children playing together, brothers and sisters. So there's going to be a diverse age group. So we want to make sure of attractions that appeal to those different age groups. So we have some for older children and younger children. So that's typically how a splash pad would ideally be designed. Um, all of these splash pads, this one as well as the others that we'll see going all of them, this one and the next one, um, are designed to have a recirculating system. So there will actually be a water containment vessel, there will be pumps, there will be chemicals to keep the water clean, filters to keep the water clean, UV, those type of things to, to maintain the water quality. Since this is such a large splash pad, uh, something like it can run around, I think it was 450 pounds a minute roughly. Um, that's not water that you just put to waste. Uh, we want to capture that and reuse it and repurpose it. So that's something that, that is designed into that feature. So, again, just some different images of what they look like. Uh, yeah, the one you mentioned is the bucket. Um, there's a large uh, dumping bucket on there. It's an iconic attraction. A lot of kids love that. A lot of families love it. It you know, gets a large volume of water dumping on it. It draws people to that area, so it's very iconic. It's really neat. And we did put the city hospital's uh, logo on there. That was and so these are, are still pictures, but that was a question that had entered my mind. Is this something that fills up and then falls over to push that large volume? And yeah, so there's a blue pipe at the top is the fill, and there's a counterweight in the bucket. So once it reaches a certain volume, it'll tip over, and then you can see the yellow is representative of the shed roof. It's a, actually a clear um, acrylic-like material. Uh, polycarbonate like material that uh, the water hits and then sheds off and it actually has a slight upturn to it so it throws the water up a little bit to give it a little more pizzazz plus it stops it from actually dumping straight on there so <laughs> if all of you remember the uh, water challenge or you know the ice bucket challenge um, it's not pleasant to sit under it <laughs> so we have the water dispersed and then we can time that so that we can have it run for in time every three minutes, every five minutes, every two minutes, we can just by affecting the valley of how much water is being entered. But, it's pretty cool. Um, this plan shows you, identifies all the individual features um, as well as their corresponding water flows and dynamic um, information. The 
Um, flooring is just a suggested, you know, it was something they wanted to show representing it. It can be plain concrete, it can have a synthetic surface to it, so there's a lot of different options available um, depending on what the city would like to do. Um, we looked at being that it was closely located towards the existing restrooms too. The mechanical spaces ideally would be located just off of that building, which is sort of add on to it since the utilities and everything are right there and save a lot of cost. Um, we provided a budgetary information to the students. So what this document shows is the equipment. So all of the features and all of the uh, um, mechanical systems, the filters, the pumps, everything that is, we produce is in this value uh, with the, um, sorry, the freight and the packaging and everything there. So that's what it would need to get all the equipment to the site, uh, make it manufacture and get it to the site, and then you would have to add in the installation cost. Uh, one of the features that uh, Vortex uh, has included in terms of our design is all of these can be staged. So we have a system called SafeSwap, so all of the vertical features that they're mounted into the concrete, they have an anchoring system and everything like that. We can design this now so that in the you know, meantime, maybe half of those or something were just ground sprays, but then as more funds became available, they could add to that. So for facilities or cities or anybody that's you know, trying to be budget conscious, it gives them a lot of uh, opportunity to realize a full design, but not necessarily have to pay for it all right away. So it's a nice added benefit. So the students like that. So, quick question. So that cost is without installation? That's correct. Typically, do you all do installation, or do the cities do it, or how's that done? Um, we, Vortex doesn't. We have a network of installers, certified installers, uh, and channel partners. And there's actually a company outside of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, called CRS. And they um, can do the install and stuff like that. And I actually have sort of jumping on a little bit and ask them to price the different um, figures and stuff like that and we can make that presentable if, if that's what it is. But typically, the city would generally put that out to bid um, and then depending on the parameters of what the city requirements are for that, they would solicit a bid for those and then they'd be installed. So typically, you'll see the equipment provided in that separately because a lot of times cities like to purchase that direct through a purchasing program, national purchasing program, we get familiar with that or some other uh, methods, and so it saves a lot of cost from that. So part of insulation would be the point of the concrete of the base then as well? Uh, you, yes, you, the, the site work, so the excavation, the, the, the piping, the uh, installation of the, um, the filtration equipment, the point of the concrete, the anchors, and then the erection. Now we do have um, some costs in there for startup, because we typically like to do is send somebody from our company out make sure it's all set up properly. One of the benefits for our filtration systems is we build it all in-house, we test it all in-house, make sure it's ready to go, then we disassemble it, ship it out to site, and it's more of a plug and play type of scenario. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of that guesswork work out. But you know, you have a controller and you want to make sure everything's balanced properly. So we have experts who handle that portion. The next design, uh, we called it the OES flash pad because we were looking at somewhere near the elementary school. Um, we just selected the site that's immediately east of the, the school, uh, like the old volleyball park. Yeah, there used to be a little park there by the bathrooms and the shed and a little park there. It's called the city park on the we're not sure what it's called. So it's not on the rolls as part of the park, there's Vanderbilt Park just south of that. Yep. Um, so you know, this could ship over there if that was the case. Um, but it's nice because it is near there, it is near the Lacey Complex. Uh, we did talk about that as an opportunity to maybe sharing it with the, the Lacey Complex or the New York Community Center too. Uh, but this design, we they had said since it was high school, they wanted it to be an Oskaloosa High School, in fact, or not high school, but just a, um, a symbolism. So they had a large O uh, representative of um, Oski. And then the bucket, we put the Indian head logo on there. So we had that as well. Um, and then again, there was just a selection of different types of features. It's a much smaller splash pad, probably about half the size uh, overall. So it's 
little bit of a smaller part, they're not having as much. But again, these can develop, you know, we can take the best parts of all the different ideas and put them together into a final design. It's very involved in that regard. So the, yeah, the operation typically this class had is that the city will set it for hours of operation. So um, during the summer, it can be operating from 10 a.m. till 8 p.m. if they wanted to. And then the computer the controller will actually shut everything off so that uh, we have an activator so kids will come up and touch it. The water will flow for a period of time and then shut off. If the system shut down after those hours of operation, it won't do anything. And the activators, typically what will happen, like I said, is it's sequence. So they'll touch it, it'll turn on, different features will come on and off after whatever program that we decide. And then it'll shut off after like maybe a four or five minute period. And then they have to go back and start it again. And that way, um, it's not giving a false perception that performs water all over the place. Plus, nobody's there. It shouldn't be used. Another thing that we typically include in all of these is what's called a rain diverter system. So the main drain that's on the splash pad, what happens is during operation, the water's funneled back to the holding tank where it's treated and circulated. Um, but if a rain event happens, once the timer sets off, there's a valve that will switch and it'll actually take any water that then, like a rain event, and actually put it to storm. So that way we're not uh, disrupting the balance of the water in the holding tank, and so I'm making sure that we're not wasting a lot of chemicals or water from that. So, so again, uh, another budgetary price for the equipment and features that's associated with that. And then the Last design, one of the classes wanted to um, do something out of the city square. And obviously, um, I had the budget of the Historic Preservation Commission. So I was like, well, that, that's an interesting concept. So, um, but we, we carried through with it so they could see what the, the options are. Now, what you see on the plan is uh, really interesting. So we superimposed the, the splash pad. And the park. So it wouldn't really have much of a disruption to the area, but it would change it slightly. But I, I know there was conversations at one time what if uh, South First was closed off and became a uh, pedestrian mall type of situation, that would be a really good location that could be shifted out that way. Um, the design, however, was such that it's all ground based. There's no vertical features, it's all just ground features, so that um, it's during when it's not operating. Wouldn't really even notice it except to notice the nozzles. Um, the other aspect of this is it is a fountain that we can tie it with lights and music, which would really tie well into the whole theme and identity of what Oskaloosa is. So we can actually have this running at night and have a, a visual display, very much like what is seen in an urban uh, environment, a city of some sort. I actually had ideas at one time in my head of like if we had a ring of them around the bandstand, so when the band's playing on Thursday nights and the water's going to the music, I thought that'd be fantastic. But um, so the kids really had a lot of fun with this one. Uh, being that it is the city square and we, we wanted to be on obtrusive as possible, we really reduced it in size and scale just so it'd be more architectural and look and feel. Uh, though it still does have the same amount of fun. The difference on this one is that it's such a, it's such a low flow and very low volume of water. Typically, something like this would be a flow through. So, in which cases we wouldn't capture the water and treat it because it's not a lot of water to be wasted. Because um, otherwise, you're paying a lot more for the equipment and filter than you would for the cost of the water. Um, and that design can always be adapted and changed uh, to what the city would like to do. Other things we've done with those is we don't like to see that water just go to waste either. So we develop systems where it's a recapture and repurpose. So yeah, that water could go to a holding tank that's used for subsurface irrigation or some other purpose like that. So we, we have done those type of systems in the past as well. And that could maybe be used to water the grass. Okay. Uh, and supplement the irrigation for the park itself. Um, and again, being that it is the smaller of the three projects, it definitely has the lower post 
costs associated with that. Hmm. So at that point, uh, again, we have uh, different ideas, concepts. It's a fantastic job to have box funnels that I think. Um, but if there's any questions you have of me, uh, I'm definitely willing to take that or maybe log if you have any questions in the class. Yep. Um questions that come to my mind. You mentioned a recirculating, uh, recycling of water for the first two, uh, but that's water that's being thrown up in the air. There's probably some evaporation. Is there a consumption amount that we could expect? Yeah, it's not that great. You will. It's obviously environmental in nature, uh, so if we have a very hot, dry summer, you're going to lose more from evaporation and transpiration from that aspect of it, but since a majority of the volume of water is in a tank in the ground that's treated and recirculated, it's not evaporating. So it's not like it's open body water, it's just a little bit of aerosolization. You're actually going to get more carry out of people with water on their clothes. So a child will run through a third pool of clothes, but you know, carry out and get a gallon of water with them and then they'll drip it on a scar. <laughs> but it's not a lot. Typically, any of these systems will only have like a one inch line that goes into the tank, and the system tells it it's got a float valve in there and it recognizes when the water level drops. Um, depending on what's happening in there, the volume of water will change. I've actually included in the documents um, a couple of Excel spreadsheets that we share with our clients that give them the ability to start to input the different numbers and we can help with that again. So if we had a recirculation system, how much water is going to be used, how much is that going to cost, what's the most likelihood of uh, how much water is going to be uh, wasted. But it also depends on how busy it is. So you know, obviously on the weekends you're going to have a lot more children out there. Water is going to be circulating a lot faster and a lot more often. Uh, whereas if it's a mobile leaf, maybe not as much. Do you find that these compete with swimming pools? They don't compete. They supplement. Uh, they they have their different needs. Uh, so no lifeguard. No lifeguards. <laughs> the the benefit to that is there are no requirements for a lifeguard because you don't have any standing water, um, and that provides a lot of comfort and reassurance to families with young children who might not be able to swim. Um, it also helps to bring in more people that have different types of abilities or different age groups that, that are not as comfortable getting into the pools. So we actually see these a lot either within a pool complex that they maybe are you know, on a, you know, off to the side, somewhere like a, a playground at the pool and moms feel comfortable, or they're outside of a pool or they're nearby um, just because it's a nice complementary feature. And so you get different age groups growing, you know, going with those different uh, groups. So I wouldn't say it, it competes. It, uh, again, it's just a supplemental type of element. Um, but we do have smaller communities that uh, like to, to use those in lieu of a pool um, because of the operational costs associated with the pool. Um, lifeguards being one of them, obviously, and then pay for the lifeguards. But um, many times we see a lot of our features in the pool. Well, Adam, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to tell Adam and Scott how impressed I was with what the students did, as well as you. And I hope you take that back because they're still in school, and and tell them they did a really outstanding job of their PBL, in my opinion. Yep. All the data that we have, it looks like that you have annual maintenance costs on the three proposal. Um, the those were just uh, generic. I'm not sure, Mike, if you, you didn't input anything in there. No, what, what we would typically do is we would just you know, at some point have a conversation, sit down, and, and make sure all the aggregate labor costs are factored in there. Make sure the water rates, the aggregate number in there, and then we would work with you to develop it because um, we do so many of these all over the world. They're all numbers are all over too. So. <laughs> It's not always uh, set that way, um, but it's very easy to plug in and drop that in and do all the calculations. Thank you. Well, please pass on that the mayor and council were very impressed with the work that was done. And so 
uh, let everyone know that we are very pleased with what we've seen. And thank you very much for doing such an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we ought to fill in the outside pool and build one. <laughs> what would you say? We'd, we'd save the leak, we'd save the repair, mm -hmm. and originally we were talking about getting rid of that pool, and now somehow we're thinking about keeping that pool. So, so it's good to have ideas. Yeah. So. Well, and, and Mayor Council, we talked about the design of the recreation facility, the early child education center, and that part of the discussion is the potential of including a splash pad feature like this. So. It, I think being careful not to create competition or maybe even supplementing what we're already doing there uh, is important. I think there were some ideas that you could have them in multiple locations. And they, again, they're not necessarily competing. It just gives the community a, a flavor of what we can offer and then hope that they would uh, use the, the larger recreation facility uh, for, uh, on a more often basis. Well, maybe I misread that meeting, but I thought it was kind of I didn't think it was very popular to do it. I mean, I thought it was a good idea, but at the rec center. Did I, I didn't take that. Did I, mis did I misread that? No, I, Somebody I, wasn't interested in it. One of the, I don't know. I thought the, the idea was brought up. I just didn't know that we got to yeah. the point of deciding what all went in yet. Yeah, I think just looking at the options now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, item B. Uh, this is a public hearing uh, to consider the resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost for the facade improvement project phase two. Curtis Architecture and Design has prepared plans and specs for the Oskaloosa facade improvement project. Uh, the project includes facade improvements for six properties in the uh, downtown Oskaloosa. Uh, pre preliminary architectural opinion of the probable cost was $674,406. There's a lot here. Uh, the project has received approval from the Iowa Economic Development Authority for compliance with state historic preservation standards. And it has also received a certificate of appropriateness from the Oskaloosa Historic Preservation Commission. If the project is awarded, construction is expected to begin in June, depending on the weather, with completion expected at the end of calendar 2019. Uh, so uh, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing to receive any comments. As, and so is there anyone here who would like to speak to this? Seeing none, I'll close it. I'll close the hearing. Uh, there is an update on the bids. The construction bids were received and publicly opened on Wednesday, May 8th. There is only one bid received that was 20% higher than the architect's estimate. And so the project team is reviewing the bid details and discussing options to close the funding gap with the idea of keeping the property owner share at 25%. Uh, consideration of these items will occur at a later meeting. So uh, do we have uh, support for the resolution approving the plan specifications, form of contract, and estimated cost? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I'm just curious, how did we get the bids and we're just, we're just approving the plans? Is it just the concept, I guess? So at, at the last meeting, which was a month ago, yeah. you, the council gave preliminary approval of the plans right. and then directed us to go out for bids with the projects. So we're required to hold a public hearing and give notice for that. So now we're going to approve it twice. Yeah, this is your final approval okay. of the plans. Yeah. If I approve it, I'm not saying I'm willing to pay the extra, right? Yeah. 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 So the, the notion is one of we, we offer a preliminary idea. Uh, but then after the bids come in, uh, the reason for the hearing is what if someone brings in a piece of wisdom that, you know, hey, you're making a mistake here or you should do something different. It's an opportunity to get that fixed yet before we start finalizing things. No? Okay, we've got a motion. We've got the second. Any further discussion? And, and Mayor Council, we did make a note here about the bids, and so the architect has been asked to, to go back and talk to the contractor, see if there are ways of value engineering some of the, the design. They're checking their, their subcontractor bids as well to see that the quantities are correct and they're in fact where they think they really should be. See if we can drive those down a little bit. Uh, the last facade phase, we, we asked the Daily Trust for funding to 
help keep the property on its hold. I don't know if that will necessarily be on the table this time, but we could reach out to them again. Uh, there could be just a, an additional request. We already expect to ask the state for uh, additional grant funds that are available. Uh, and then we would come to you and let you know where we've ended up. And there may be a need for the city to contribute further for this project to, to happen, or there have been other places that will place the additional increased cost on the property owners themselves. So that's an option as well. I, I'm sure. curious, I've forgotten, how much does the block grant cover of this? Uh, you requested $450,000. Correct. And we're eligible for an additional $50,000. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Roll call, please. Burnett? Yes. Dodger? Yes. Dross? Yes. Moore? Yes. Audison? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. That passes. Okay, item C is to consider a resolution levying a special assessment against proper, private property for snow removal uh, in accordance with section 12.12 .12 of the city code. Um, there are five properties here uh, with total fees of $1,300. And so I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this tonight? Seeing none, I'll close the hearing. Uh, there were certified notices sent to each property owner. Notice was published in the OSCE Herald. Uh, if approved, the property owner has 30 days from the time of filing with the Mahaska County Treasurer to pay for the <coughs> snow removal. And then after 30 days, it will be assessed to property taxes with a payment schedule at 9% interest. Um, we have a motion of support for this. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion? Roll call. Kyle Jerry? Yes. Dross? Yes. Moore? Yes. Audison? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Yes. Burnett? Yes. Okay, that passes. Item D is to consider a request for a parking restriction on 4th Avenue West. Uh, requiring, requiring an ordinance amendment to Oskaloosa Municipal Code Chapter 10.48. This is the second reading. Uh, the property owner of 815 4th Avenue West, Jeffrey Shelton, has requested the parking restriction in the 800 block on 4th Avenue West. He complained that he's got, had difficulty exiting from his driveway when there are parked vehicles on the roadway. And he also indicated the garbage and delivery drivers are unable to turn around at his driveway and are forced to back up on A Avenue West towards South H Street. As a result, the staff studied 4th Avenue West from South H to the dead end to have an overall view of on-street parking requirements in the area. The study corridor is a local residential street with low traffic volumes. A survey was sent out to all property owners who have properties contiguous to the study area. Of the three property owners who responded to the survey, two of them did not want any parking restriction. One of them did want a parking restriction along the south side from 818 4th Avenue West to the dead end. So as part of the study, staff also researched the crash history for the last five years, found no accidents in the subject corridor. And the pavement width on 4th Avenue West does narrow from 30 feet near the intersection of South H and 4th Avenue West down to 22 feet near the dead end. Although there is low traffic volume and no reported crashes, a parking restrictions that is just at the dead end that's approximately 30 feet long may help with this request because the road narrows at the dead end. The dead end section of the roadway also doesn't have a cul-de-sac or hammerhead to allow for vehicles to turn around. And so staff is recommending that we approve the second reading of this ordinance, authorizing the parking restriction at the dead end of the subject corridor. Uh, do you have a motion to support that? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Dross? Yes. Moore? Yes. Hudson? Yes. Wally? Yes. Yates? Yes. Burnett? Yes. Fadger? Yes. Okay. That passes. And there it is. Okay. Moving on. Uh, item E is to consider a resolution accepting the completion of the new street lights for the D Street reconstruction project that was done by Sport Moscow Sports Lighting, LLC. And this approves the retainage amount of $7,282.50. Uh, so in our explanation, on May 7, the street lights for the D Street Reconstruction Project were completed by Moscow Sports Lighting. The street lighting project was completed during the same construction time frame as the ongoing pavement reconstruction project, but was bid separately in order to prevent delays from the Iowa DOT bidding process. Staff's inspected this project and is recommending to accept the project as completed. 
The scope of the project includes all the work associated with the construction of 11 new street poles on D Avenue, excuse me, D Street between A Avenue West and the East West Alley that's south of 2nd Avenue West. Final contract amount of the project was $145,650, and that was after a net decrease of $13,350, namely 8.4%, from the original contract amount, which was $159,000 and awarded on the May 7, 2018 City Council meeting. The total cost of the project in the amount of $145,650 included a 5% retainage in the amount of $7,282.50. With City Council approval, this project will be accepted as complete. Approval of the completion of the project activates the warranties for the project and authorizes the release of the retainage in the amount of $7,282.50 30 days after the project is accepted if no claims are filed against the project. Total cost breakdown is listed here in the agenda. Uh, do we have a motion supporting the acceptance of this uh, project? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? I'm just impressed that they found a, a day that they could take a picture when ah, the sun was shining. So so Isn't that beautiful? I'm impressed <laughs> by that. Slides look great. It looks even better when there's a pretty blue sky like that. So. Okay. They work. We believe they work, yes. <laughs> You gotta put a quarter in, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to get it right. <laughs> <laughs> He's abstaining. Yeah. <laughs> Roll call, please. Moore? Yes. Hardison? Yes. Walling? Yes. Yates? Abstain due to my role with Musco. Burnett? Yes. Kyle Jerry? Yes. Dress? Yes. Dress? <laughs> that passes. <laughs> okay. Gets us to the end of the regular agenda. Uh, reports from city staff. City manager, anything? Uh, okay. City clerk, anything? No, city attorney, anything? No, thank you. Okay. Moving on to the council members. How about if we start down with Bob Ross? Uh, congratulations to the class in 2019 in Oski. Graduation yesterday. Quite a class. A little partial to that as is Council Gates. Uh, <laughs> and our city clerk. And the city clerk, yeah, absolutely. So, congratulations to them, best luck with all they've got going on. Okay. Joe? I have nothing. Mm -hmm. Diane? No, thank you. I, I want to repeat that same thing. Great class. It's going to make the rest of them feel like you didn't appreciate them too much. <laughs> I do, but every year I think, and they get better. And it seems like every year they get a little better, which really makes me proud. Doug? Nothing nice, sir. Tom? Well, I can say third, but you did a good job, Bob, starting <laughs> to the kids. Um, on Carmel Road, and Mike, we already talked about the reflectors, but we're still having uh, storm water issues. In the big rains, but yes, if we could get, I think all we need is uh, a couple of the tiles added or something. So I don't have to hear about we don't have storm sewers, but we don't have city sewer either. But we couldn't get the storm, you know. Water clear across the road. Okay, thank you. And on Christie Bridges Point, um, I assume we're going to follow up on that. You know, I think the sinkhole, the sinkhole does concern me both with the little kids, but I'm not sure, and Achilles probably knows, you, what's going on on North 11th, but, you know, there's a lot of sinkholes here lately, you know, we're building on a coal mine, and there's three yards that have sunk out of sight, they've been working there for weeks now, filling those back up, pumping concrete in them and all that, so um, sinkholes are an issue, so if it's, you know, if it's just poor drainage tile and it's eroded away, it shouldn't be a big deal. But if there is something under there, we ought to try to figure that out. And, and Tom, if I can jump in on that. I'm president of the uh, Board of Health at our last meeting. Eric Dershke was talking about, yeah, they have had some sinkholes develop along North 11th. Uh, the, uh, trying to think, funding's coming from the county or the, the state and any of those have the state, my correct me. Uh, those have been filled in, my understanding is those have been addressed, but typically it's something like that where you're having 
sinkholes per se coming from old mines. There are some state programs that come in to address that. That's why I'm saying we should look into it. Yeah, and those have been major, and, and we'll just make sure this isn't going to be major, and hopefully it's a small thing and we can fix it. And she has been here before about that. But it's been, I guess she might have called recently, but I'm pretty sure it's been three or four years. Well, three days to me, I've seen it. Yeah, there. because I think um, Public Works was under a different person. Yeah. Steve, anything? No, sir. Okay. And I've got nothing new as well. Uh, with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? No move. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. We're adjourned.